<laughs> Good evening, uh, and uh, uh, a very, very warm welcome, and you've just been giving one to our honored guest, to the British Library. I'm Roly Keating, I'm Chief Executive here. Um, I hope some of you may have had a chance to visit um, the exhibition we put on to, to mark this extraordinary Shakespeare 400 year uh, anniversary. It's called uh, Shakespeare in 10 Acts. Uh, and we were just saying as a library determined to show that literature and the imagination and knowledge are things that are alive and living, we have focused on Shakespeare in performance over those 400 years and choosing 10 moments which in their different ways perhaps changed the world a little more, both about how Shakespeare was perceived or how about how his words and his imagination changed the world in different ways. And if you have been, you will notice that unusually one of those spaces is devoted to a single production uh, of A Midsummer Night's Dream at the Royal Shakespeare Company uh, in 1970. And of course, the guiding uh, vision, the director behind that, um, was our great our guest tonight, uh, Peter Brook, one of the great figures of world theatre, endlessly inquiring, curious, sensitive to performance and text, and of course, always alive with curiosity and an inspiration to us all. I suspect everyone here has been touched in different ways by what Peter has done and continues to do. Um, before I came to the British Library, my life was in arts programming uh, at the BBC, and of course, Peter's work was always a fascination for us. I'm honoured to this day that he agreed when um, I had the privilege of launching BBC Four that we were able to show Peter's extraordinary intimate filmed production of his great Hamlet um, with Adrian Lester. And even this afternoon, uh, Peter, thank you, coming, coming from Paris, we've been working you hard. Um, uh, already, Peter has delivered a lecture here, The Skyscraper, and if you weren't there, this was about the profane and the esoteric in Shakespeare and much, much more than that. Um, it was uh, filmed, recorded, I think, and we will be making sure uh, that we do make that available for those, afraid like me, that weren't able to be there. Um, but it is so uh, lovely to be able to spend time exploring Shakespeare uh, in this way. Um, and I'm delighted to say we have not just uh, Peter here tonight to explore um, that great Midsummer Night's Dream moment, but also three of the original cast members you'll see in a moment, Sir Ben Kingsley, Francis de la Tour, and Barry Stanton. Um, it remains only for me to um, say that I very much hope you uh, enjoy the evening and to hand to your real host, uh, one of the, the great scholars of Shakespeare in performance, the uh, uh, um, uh, McMill Family Chair in Shakespeare Studies at the University of Notre Dame in Indiana, Peter Holland. Peter. Thank you. Can I just say one word? Please. I'd like to say one word but it's very difficult after what we've just heard for me to say anything because I don't want it to sound tit for tat. What I wanted to say here very simply before knowing that you're going to be speaking was that this is the best exhibition I've ever been to. And all praise to Zoe and her team for putting oh, yeah. it together. And, and her. her. Um, it is impossible to introduce the person who, for me, has, since I saw the first of his productions, I saw King Lear with Paul Schofield on stage at the Aldwych in 1962. I was, of course, pushed in in my pushchair. Um, uh, P Peter Brook has been the greatest theatre director of our time, uh, so I can't introduce him because what, what would one say? Uh, I want to offer two things by way of introduction. Uh, one is a quotation, uh, and the other is a memory. So the quotation is unusually from a theatre review, because theatre reviews come and they go and they vanish. But some theatre reviews deserve to be remembered. And I want to quote from the review by Clive Barnes, the theatre critic of the New York Times, who flew over to, to England in order to see the first night of A Midsummer Night's Dream at Stratford. And here's part of his review that he published in the New York Times. Once in a while, once in a very rare while, 
a theatrical production arrives that is going to be talked about as long as there is a theater, a production, which for good or ill is going to exert a major influence on the contemporary stage. If Peter Brook had done nothing else but this dream, he would have deserved a place in theater history. And I admire that as a piece of writing, uh, and gosh, it was accurate. The memory is my own. Uh, I went up to see the show uh, for a matinee, and I drove up from London with my girlfriend, and we were running late because the traffic was bad on the motorway, and I couldn't find anywhere to park, and I left the car on double yellow lines, mm. uh, being sure it was going to be towed away, and I got into the theatre at about two minutes to two, thinking, why have I driven 100 miles, even for Peter Brook, to see A Midsummer Night's Dream? And I came out with a deeper sense of joy and satisfaction and delight and thoughtfulness and every other emotion conceivable than any other production has ever given me before or since. For those of you who saw it, you'll remember that feeling. For those of you who didn't, I'm sorry, you have no idea what you've missed. <laughs> um, but there was something peculiarly special about that time in the theater that filled us with feelings that we didn't know we could have so intensely across that time. Mm. What we're going to do is, Peter and I are going to talk for a little bit, and then we'll invite up the cast members to talk rather more. But Peter, I wanted to ask you about the kind of journey that took you towards wanting to do A Midsummer Night's Dream. After all, what you had mostly explored in Shakespeare before then had been extraordinary tragedy, King Lear. Before that, that revelatory production of Romeo and Juliet, the, put love over the, as you said, the Verona sewers, or Titus Andronicus, where you dis rediscovered a play that nobody thought was kind of worth doing. And you said, worth doing, it's astonishing. And Love's Labour's Lost. And Love's Labour's Lost, where you found that darkness at the end so, so wonderfully, so memorably in the descriptions I've read of it. Dream wasn't a likely play somehow. And I'm wondering about what, what led you towards that in the journey of thinking about other productions of the play, other productions of other plays you, you've done or have been watching or whatever. Well, you know, that remains an open question because when one's finished any production, there are always friends who come up with suggestions of what you should do. <laughs> Sent manuscripts. If I've done, oh, I do a play, Chekhov. So alas, then all the other work, people are saying, well, now you'll do Uncle Vanya, won't you? And someone else says, no, 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 it's not nearly as interesting as if you do Ivanov. And so it goes <laughs> on. And the same with operas. I mean, the amount of operas that have, and on the contrary, I gave up doing opera until we could make our own choice completely. But the mystery is that all of that, people's suggestions, even you looking at things yourself, are preparing the way for that marvelous moment, which is something that every actor knows so well, which is that moment when it happens. Mm -hmm. And I never know how it is out of all those potential things clamoring for attention, it's suddenly quite clear this is, and it's a sense. That's why I feel that you have to, without it just being a matter of being topical and reading the press and listening to the radio and the TV, one has to, and by nature one is, in touch with the flow of life at each moment. And that's what guides one to feeling, ah, at this moment, this is what should be done. So in a way, one says it's the play that is knocking on the door. And there's a moment when you stop for a moment and can say, come in. And I think of work you were doing around that time, famously the extraordinary show, we never knew how, quite how to pronounce it. Was it called Us or US, which was the point, yeah. uh, uh, a, a show about uh, opposition to the Vietnam War, which took you in a more strongly, explicitly mm -hmm. political direction than I think any of your other work in terms of a, an immediate po politics. Mm -hmm. From there to Midsummer Night's Dream, it looks like an impossible flip of the coin, but it isn't. It isn't. And I wonder about that. that because 
Well, it's the same for this moment when we're really in one of the most brutally horrible moments in the cycle of humanity, whichever way we look. And within it, there's a need for something that goes beyond light entertainment. We need that, but we need something that goes beyond, something that in some way can give us a positive feeling. And that, well, all the work of Shakespeare has that, this particular masterpiece, The Midsummer Night's Dream, is in that direction the richest and the fullest. And it was so obvious after this. We've made in the film Tell Me Lies, and we've been right into the whole Vietnam War. And people would always say, stupidly, do you think that you can stop a war with a play in the theatre, which is so idiotic it's not worth answering? <laughs> of course not. But what I can do is for the people who are there both to live in a new way the intensity of the questions that it puts to us all and at the same time not to go out, as you do from the political theatre, more angry than when you come in. Mm -hmm. That is monstrous. Mm -hmm. and that is, you know... A, you're not changing the world, but you are doing a disservice to your little world of the audience. If the audience comes out feeling worse, yes. more angry, more frustrated, more ready to go out and kick somebody in the balls or break a shop window than when they come in. So the shift from that to a supreme masterpiece of Shakespeare, but masterpiece in the pure inner sense of something that is radiant and that that's what seemed at that very moment this is the most radiant play of Shakespeare's. But it's a play which in 1970 did not look as though it was radiant. I mean mm -hmm. you discovered the play that, that we all know now is there but it had looked like a little bit of children's, you know, the play that children most often see as perhaps their first Shakespeare, uh, a play that was almost over-familiar, and you managed to make it so freshly new. But I didn't manage to make it. It just seemed to me clear that if you have a play, and the same eventually goes to The Tempest, you have a play about spirits, and if you have a play about fairies, a play about... Imagine with him. You can see that in our language, thank God the word has been so overused that we don't use it anymore, but if you try to come back to what it meant, somebody having a soul. Yes. Soul. Nobody's ever painted one. People have tried to take photographs of fairies. Nobody's ever <laughs> succeeded. Nobody has actually truly seen a ghost. But the sense of a, a spirit world... That's what drew us into working with people like us from Africa, for whom this is self-evident. They are brought up, and I think Shakespeare was also, in a world in the country when the presence, the spirit of a tree, the spirit of a flower, were not theoretical questions. It was self-evident. Yes. I mean, there were places, I think it's the American Indians, who when they pull up a plant because they want to use it perhaps for decoration, perhaps for cooking, apologize, just say, excuse me. And I mean, this can make us laugh today, but what's behind it is acknowledging the spirit world. And here I'd seen, because it was a legend, you know, Max Reinhardt was a legend for me, and I heard marvelous things about him including the fact of somebody going into one of his rehearsals and thinking to see this dynamic German director at work had just found a man sitting just quietly perched on a stool, not saying a word and just watching. And, and so I, that touched me more than to know that he had managed to build a real forest yes. with real rabbits. <laughs> and from what I'd seen, a fairy was girl from the local ballet school in a little short skirt jumping around. And I thought, 
I didn't have to put those ideas up. It just didn't make sense in relation to the fact that this is about a spirit, an invisible world. There had been one earlier production, I think, that treated the play with the same seriousness that you approached it with, the same respect. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was Harley Granville Barker's. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Granville Barker famously, and there's photographs in the exhibition of the fairies who wore gold leaf and mm -hmm. had strange headdresses mm -hmm. and were anything but English fairies. Mm -hmm. And it was as if Granville Barker knew there was something stranger, more powerful there than we had you know, people before had, had uh, discovered. But he said something that was remarkably prescient. He said that actually to do Midsummer Night's Dream, all you need is a white box. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> In 1913, he anticipated what you went on to discover. What, what led you to, was that already in place in the early stages of thinking about the play, the idea that this was going to be very much an empty space? That was self-evident that one wanted air and space. It's a pity Sally Jacobs isn't here with us today. We so wanted her to be it because we worked so closely together, I can't say how anything arose. But it was quite clear that we wanted not to illustrate in this silly way of illustrating fairies, and we didn't want to illustrate night and darkness when the play itself is radiant. And so I think that we looked for the instrument that could serve it. So we needed doors and we needed steps and we needed this possibility of a world from which the spirits look down and can see what fools we mortals are because they're on the gallery above. And so all that was a practical need which Sally then found a way of making harmonious. But the whiteness was a way of just saying, not forest, not decor, but let forest be conjured up yes. in the imagination. And it was to have the freedom of the imagination, which is the essence of Shakespeare, because in Shakespeare, I found something that since then I've always found in the, in, in the different traditional countries with storytellers, that a storyteller, just if he says, a night fell, just that, and everybody thought, well, that's what the story needs. He can then say, into that night suddenly came, and you're off on the stories picking up. So it's in that way, the elimination of illustration was to free the imagination. It sounds like Mies van der Rohe, less is more. Yes. The more you strip away, the more there is. Oh, yes. And how do you reach the confidence to allow the audience or encourage the audience to find that imagination? You because you're working against <laughs> the prevailing tendency in theatre yes, at that yes. time. Yeah, but you have to. You have to. <laughs> I'm going in a moment to ask yes. our three actors to join us, but I want to give the audience a taste of the white box. Oh, There's, yes. As many of you know, the, the production was fully filmed in Japan, but the prints were destroyed. I keep hoping that a bootleg copy will somehow appear later. There are tiny fragments and our First clip just gives you a taste of that white box, and you'll see entering into it this tiny sequence one of the people who's going to join us on stage. Can we run the first clip? John Kane as Puck. We must talk in a minute about that extraordinary costume. Christopher Gable as Lysander. And let me invite on stage Demetrius and Helena, and Snug the Joiner, and later Bottom, <laughs> Ben Kingsley, Francis de la Tour, and Barry Stanton. Come and join us. <laughs> I have to say that every time I see that clip, I, I wonder 
at, at John Cain's confidence that you will not hit one of the stilts as you run onto the stage. It was tempting. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you about, just since we've just watched that, I mean, how you got towards that stage? I mean, what, what we really want to talk about is something about the rehearsal journey for this production. But this, is, this must have been a, a, a moment of risk-taking for you. Well, I think it started with the urgency with which Peter described storytelling. Um, I think one of the most treasured notes during rehearsal, and I think Francis probably overheard it, <laughs> was after we had um, rather ostentatiously and overconfidently rehearsed the four lovers scene. <laughs> and dear Peter came slowly towards me and he put his hand on my shoulder and said, dear Ben, <laughs> that was absolutely suburban. <laughs> that's the kind of passion and and vigor with which and, and love with which he wished to mm. redefine uh, the old versions of storytelling mm. and bring something new. So with that with that tough love in the rehearsal room. Uh, to which I responded joyfully, uh, because it's, uh, it's always a great, co a great compliment to say, now jump 12 feet, mm. now jump 15. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the, the, the choreography, uh, which came, in fact, shockingly late in, in the rehearsal process, uh, but it came out of our relationship to one another. Mm. Uh, David came naturally wishing to look down on us, what fools these mortals be. It all had a logic. Nothing was extraneous. It, mm -hmm. all, it all docked into the same central, beautiful concept of urgently telling a story to the best of our ability and not to be. Mm -hmm. Do you have a similar memory of trying to avoid suburbanness? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we had a nearly, I think, a 10-week rehearsal period, mm -hmm. which was unheard of. Mm -hmm. And wonderful, because that meant that we could not only, in rehearsal, say our own lines of our own character, but we also spoke the lines of, mm -hmm. of the other characters. Mm -hmm. I remember reading mm. a few lines of Puck, or, and mm. that meant that we were beginning to be part of the whole, not just mm. me and, mm. and my character. And then there was, of course, the rehearsals, um, which I, we didn't have to do, but spin the plates. Mm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <laughs> and um, there was a period when Peter left for a bit. I think he, um, I don't know what the reason was, but uh, right. just to leave us anyway and just to feel it and get on with it. And before he went, he said, I just want you to think about, I don't know if you remember this, Barry, but he said, um, what is, just think about what is the secret of the play. Do you remember that? Yeah. And... And we were spinning plates and doing our lines and on the trapezes and and we said, what is the secret of the play? <laughs> 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 and we came up with <laughs> hate, love, love, hate, <laughs> ah, passion, truth. And we thought, we've got to have an answer because Peter's going to come back soon <laughs> and he's going to say, what is the secret of the play? But he didn't ask us that. Mm. He just left us with the question. Mm. And in that little bit of rehearsal that, that Ben was talking about, it was um, a feeling of we're not quite sure what to do now because Peter had given us, or it was there, he presented to us this freedom mm -hmm. to be able to express it physically, mm -hmm. which was quite unusual um, in English theatre, anyway, to be mm -hmm. physical on stage. And I remember getting very upset at one point and thinking, I don't, I'm, just, I'm just upset. And I remember I was beginning to cry. And so I walked back to the back of the rehearsal room and Peter came up to me so sweetly and said, what, what's, what's, what's the matter? And I said, I, I just can't, I'm so 70s now. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I said, I can't feel the love. <laughs> <laughs> I 
just, I just can't. And, and Peter said, well, I think you'll find that's exactly what Helena is feeling. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, just try mm. whatever it takes to get your man. <laughs> <laughs> so we did our scene, and that's when I did a kind of rugger tackle on Ben. <laughs> <laughs> and Ben was wonderful because he just went, right, here I am, flat on my, flat <laughs> on my back. This actress is on top of me, and we're saying the lines of Shakespeare. Having spent weeks being told rightly by explained and revealed by Peter that it is in the language that you find everything. So although it was, it was this wonderful contradiction of very physical acting and very clear trying to be anyway, to saying it with the words. We weren't counting rhythms, but we were saying it with the words. I did at one point say to Peter, I don't know how to make rhyming couplets <laughs> real. De dum de dum de dum and Peter said, well, isn't it wonderful that your character speaks in rhyming couplets? <laughs> so when somebody asks you something, you answer in a rhyming couplet. Well, that's a wonderful talent to have. Anybody asks you something, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. So, and it was such a wonderful note, because I thought, yes, mm. how happy some or other some can be through <laughs> Athens, I am thought as fair as she. <laughs> <laughs> One of a memory, anyway. <laughs> a bit better than that. <laughs> <laughs> Barry, I think one of the things that, that so many people remember of the production was the utter seriousness with which the workers approached mm. their work. Mm. It could be death if you failed. It could, uh, presumably. <laughs> yes. I mean, that's why it was so keen. There was an amazing moment in rehearsal, early on in rehearsal, when the mechanicals, who were the lower class and I were shoved into a room where we were rehearsing and the, the door wasn't locked but it was closed. There was a sink and hundreds of costumes. Come and perform before the Duke and the Duchess but you must look your best. You must do everything you can. We spent two hours in that room mm -hmm. getting more and more nervous, combing our hair over, mm -hmm. I had hair then, combing our hair over and over again and, and trying to look slick, trying to look like they, we thought they would be. And then we were shown in to this room, which was horrifying in a way, because it was filled with candles. And they had these extraordinary clothes of feathers and beautiful velvets on. And we were really, really suburban. Mm -hmm. And we somehow had to get a, beyond that and become this play. And we were chosen. That We kept saying, we've been chosen. They haven't. The other blokes haven't been. We've been chosen. We're the best. And that's how we did it. Mm -hmm. And it, for me, that was one of the greatest moments in that whole thing of shoving you into that room and forcing you to get dressed up and comb your hair. And it worked. And we, but you said a wonderful thing later. You said, ah, very, very good. But I just realized you can't perform comedy in candlelight. And that was a very mm -hmm. important thing. So we played the scene with the lights full up. Yeah. <laughs> very important. Mm -hmm. And you can't play can, you know, in candlelight comedy. It doesn't work. I remember, how could I forget, the lion's head. Oh, the lion's head. I was allowed to design that myself. <laughs> yes, I, the wonderful Sally Jacobs, who did the costumes and everything, and she allowed me to go up to the workshop and design my own lion's head. Well, what do you do? how do you make a lion's head if you're a joiner? You make it out of wood, and it, it's, it's something like a, either a chest of drawers or a cupboard. <laughs> so it was between the two. So it was a lion's head there with a, a very strange lion's head thing. And as I came up, I opened the doors. <laughs> and there was the real lion inside. So that was, I love the lion's head, yes. It, I was allowed to... in making. I mean, it was the sense I was of to make what, does, what does a joiner feel pride in yes. what he makes? Yes, exactly that. Yes, it, I was very proud of my lion's head. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to take it home, not look after it. <laughs> no, it's true. But Barry, you spoke of um, the uh, mechanicals and their sense of being chosen. Mm. Now, the wonderful thing that we experienced with Peter prior to the rehearsal process is that the whole of the RSC, Stratford-based company, and it was a big company, we had a dressing room number 24. Mm. I think now it stops at seven or something. <laughs> Huge company, anyway. We, we entered into a workshop for mm. Peter, mm. and we, we worked together, and out of that huge company and thrilling workshop, 
we were chosen. And that is a marvelous way to start a rehearsal mm. process. Mm. Absolutely. That you've been already, you have the confidence of knowing in that room you'll be, you'll be nourished, mm -hmm. you'll be guided, you'll be encouraged, you will never be auditioned. And there's a huge difference. Mm. Yes. Mm. Hence at the reading, Peter's technique of using, you do that bit, you do that bit, you do that mm. bit. Wonderful. So you listen to your own lines mm. from somebody else's mouth for the only time in that entire wonderful idea. Mm. I've used it since always. <laughs> <laughs> That's now, great. You, you had worked with Peter earlier mm. on us, US. Mm. Uh, how did that kind of enable you to carry forward? Because I don't think you two had worked with Peter prior to Dream. I hadn't worked. No. Um, and I wonder about the feeling of, oh, I, I have a rough idea how this magician operates. Uh, how the no idea. Works. No, no. <laughs> no idea. Completely different. Totally different set of uh, organizational rules. But what Peter gives you is total freedom. Absolute total freedom, but within very tight lines. And that's what an actor needs all the time, I think. Yeah, do anything you want, but within the restriction of this. Mm -hmm. And that's what produces that suction of energy that comes out of you, I think. And it perfectly suits Shakespeare, which is beautifully organized language, which you cannot improvise. No, you can't. You stay within no, you the hammer to the rhyming yeah. couplet. You stay within the beautiful discipline of that language. Mm -hmm. So you have, and the white box, and you have mm -hmm. Peter's mm -hmm. fantastic limits and the writer's mm -hmm. limits, so that we were held in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't rattle around in a vacuum, do you? That's no, not no. freedom. It's no. often mi misunderstood as being no. freedom, but it mm -hmm. is. Just the concentration of the box. Yeah. 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 Alone. Yeah. Even for the mechanicals in the forest, mm -hmm. it was a concentration. Mm -hmm. Extraordinary. Mm -hmm. I'd well, never worked in a white. Had you ever worked in a, a box like, I mean, apart from a box set, which is mm -hmm. boring, but that it is, you're right, it's a funnel, isn't it? Mm -hmm. A funnel of energy and a funnel of emotion. A wonderful space to walk onto. Isn't and it? there behind us is, is Sally Jacobs. And we, sketch for we, it. we uh, uh, Peter uh, mm -hmm. um, allowed us when we weren't on stage performing our particular roles to be on the gallery watching. Mm -hmm. So we all remember every line of the play mm -hmm. because it's, you know, it, it's ingrained. It's in our, it's a cellular memory because we never went back to our dressing room. That was the place to be. Yep. Yeah, yeah, we didn't. And you wanted to be. Oh yeah. oh, yeah, very much. And there is one of those curious kind of wire slinkies that became the trees and yeah. Could, yeah. Could, could make the, the, the forest a dangerous place. Oh. I, I want to pick up that, that notion of the precision of Shakespeare's language because one of the things, Peter, that you had experimented with uh, a little uh, just prior to this, as you were moving towards filming King Lear, was asking Ted Hughes to, as it were, translate the play, rewrite the play. Mm. And it's it always seemed an, an extraordinary moment, and here is a very great poet, confronting the idea of remaking Shakespeare, and yet you both realized this was a, a false route, or was it a necessary stage? And we, you were talking so beautifully earlier about going up in the lift and the different floors. Was it a necessary floor to go through to get back to what is exciting about the precision of Shakespeare's language? Well, the whole guideline in filming King Lear was to make something that's not a photograph to play, but is actually bringing King Lear through the language of cinema. Mm -hmm. And the language of cinema is inseparable from the close-up. And in the close-up, you're really so close to the thought process that we thought, is it possible to do this however well played, with a language so far from what for us is a natural language. However, in the theatre, yes, the actor can make it seem completely natural, but in close-up, will this? So with Ted, we said, let's make the experiment of seeing whether you can paraphrase it. As a very, only a great poet, loving Shakespeare as Ted could do, so that imperceptibly, that the lines are crystal clear mm -hmm. and real because we were going to film it in a realistic setting. We went and found in the north of Denmark that great 
wild lunar landscape, which really was like Britain must have been mm -hmm. yeah, those hundreds of years earlier. And so we made the experiment, and Ted brought all his talent to it. And then we said, yes, it was worth attempting. But in, in fact, whatever the reason, this is an acting problem, which Paul completely, when you see in the film, Paul managed to find a way in the intimate close-up of making every line completely real to that character that you were watching. And with Ted, we said, no, this is really something that was worth attempting just to see that it's something we've got no possibility of doing, and we shouldn't. And we both agreed, good, that's the end of that. Mm. <laughs> Forgotten. Can I, can I just Please, point? Because you were... I was in Lear. I was in Lear, in the Oswald. But there's a wonderful moment in Lear when we were talking about Lear uh, there. And I said, well, where are the White Cliffs? Of, it's quite flat around mm. Skagen. Where are the White Cliffs of Dover? And you said very clearly, well, they haven't been formed yet. <laughs> <laughs> so the actor goes, oh, no, they haven't been formed yet. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant answer. <laughs> but it is absolutely, the, for me, one of the great films that examines the human face and asks, when you look at somebody's face, can you know what, what that mind behind it is capable of? Uh, and I remember it was one of the great decisions you make in the film, Peter, that, that after Gloucester's blinding, we don't see Gloucester's face. Mm. We see the face of Cornwall who has done this. Mm that that's, that's the face we want to look at. We don't want to see Gloucester suffering. We want to know how could somebody be willing to do that? Mm. I, 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 mean, I just think that there's something about the way in that which that presents faces. And one of the things, and Francis, you mentioned, this, this, this way in which this production of Dream presented bodies mm. and the intense physicality. And I, I, I it's alien to the English way of doing Shakespeare, to have bodies running around the stage and being athletic in that way and physical and aware of themselves in that way. What was going on in the rehearsal room? I mean, you, you all turned into athletes. It sort of, it became inevitable, didn't it, that we hit those targets that, that are demanded of us when we wish to present something to an audience that is profoundly thrilling and beautiful. Mm -hmm and will leave them feeling better, not worse, as Peter said this mm -hmm. afternoon. So that you, you, another great thing Peter said in the rehearsal room was that this is a, a good example of how Peter gives his actors great confidence. He told a story about a group of actors with whom he was working, presented with ancient Greek text. Mm -hmm. And they all studied it and read it phonetically, pronounced it phonetically, and then translated from their hearts and their heads, from the words and the phonetic sounds in their mouths and how it resonated in their bodies, they attempted to translate the text. It was accurate. And Peter said, only actors could do this. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful thing to share in the rehearsal room. Mm -hmm. So that having laminated that into the rehearsal room, mm -hmm. Gave you the confidence. Gave you yeah. the confidence to say, well, only actors can jump across a door and catch somebody in midair, <laughs> as famously happened night after night yes. after yeah. night. Mm. And we were lucky to have the set, or a copy of the set, a rough copy, mm -hmm. early on in rehearsal. Yes. So it seems like it's a white box, and it's been talked about as a white box, but it was so much more than that, because we, we could throw ourselves against mm. it, climb up those, uh, and they would dead like that, mm -hmm. no slope on them at all, mm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And go up and down and on the gallery and back down again and in those doors and out those doors, which was also wonderful for the, for the brightness of it and the alertness and obviously the, when the comedy was required, it was farcical as well to have a door in and the out. The door is a wonderful. You know, it's a, just in the middle of a forest, you have a door. It's just wonderful. Perfect, isn't it? Absolutely perfect. <laughs> And then there's just the odd, this extraordinary splashes of colour. Primary colours. Primary yeah. colours. Yeah. And we were slightly muted. Oh, no, I think the men were a bit brighter. I was tie-dyed. You had... We were tie-dyed. Tie-dyed, tie -dyed, yes. Did you have a coloured shirt? Blue. 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 Ours was sort of creamy and rather faded. It was mm. wonderful. We were like 
we hadn't yet found our identity as women, mm. is how I mm. saw mm. it, really. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then, well, we did at the end, because we actually, when we were watching the play within a play, we just... Oh. We've Boy, gone did we these dress wonderful, up. Yeah, beautiful. Wonderful cloaks of velvet. We were more in the realms of the king and queen then. But uh, mm. We were dressed up as well. You were dressed yeah, up, we're certainly. <laughs> smaller scale, but we were dressed up. With the candles. That yes, time. with candles. It was, yeah. it was towards the end of rehearsal, we performed, was it in a school? Mm. We didn't have the white box. That's we just right. had a gym. Well, yeah, our Birmingham first Arts audience Center. was children. Yeah. Wasn't it? Yeah. 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 And we improvised around the space, the, 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 the climbing apparatus mm. on the wall, the ropes, the mm. gallery. Yeah. That was absolutely thrilling. And it was in a man's club in Birmingham. That's right. Birmingham, yeah. 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 I couldn't remember that, really. Mm. Yeah. John Kane, who played Puck, had written a wonderful account of that moment and how exciting it was. And the you were all told to go off and talk to the children afterwards in the audience. Mm. <laughs> and he was talking to one young girl and said, you know, did you enjoy it? Yes, I enjoyed it very much. And have you been to the theatre before? Yes, lots of times. And, and oh, why is that? Oh, yes. Well, my daddy works in the theatre. <laughs> who's your daddy? Peter Brook. <laughs> <laughs> it was Little Rainer, was it? <laughs> oh, beautiful. <laughs> uh, Simon was there as well. <laughs> I, I've never heard this story. <laughs> 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 If you come across the, the proper account, John Kane, of course, <laughs> rightly tells it far better than I oh, can. That's but good about. It's, a, it's a wonderful moment. But, but that's about confronting an audience of, um, who, who don't know the story. I mean, that, mm. that's the joy of playing to children. Mm. But this was also a very adult show. This was a, a show that was showed that this is a play about desire and sexual desire and love and erotics, as well as having fun in a forest in a, in a kind of more child-friendly way. And I, I wonder about the, the dark side of the play, that this production seems so willing to get up to its elbows in and discover, uh, and how that affected particularly the lovers who go through such pain. I mean, you were talking earlier about that sense of Helen's pain. I think as the four lovers, uh, towards the end of the play, when we're discovered entwined on the forest floor, and then are invited to watch that exquisite performance of the mechanicals. Mm -hmm. That was performed in a way that was hysterically funny and suddenly profoundly moving. Mm -hmm. um, Be shrew my heart, but I pity the man, yes. says Titania. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. that's always been said rather cynically. Mm -hmm. But in our context, you believed mm -hmm. her being, and all the women in the audience at that moment, being really moved. Mm. by Bottom's declaration of his love and his death. Mm. And uh, also, we had occasion as lovers, too, to comment on it. showed a maturity. It showed a redemption. Mm. So to earn that redemption, you have to go from dark to light. Yes. Mm. Um, uh, you will not earn that redemption otherwise. So uh, I think we all were so steeped in, in Shakespeare's stroke, Peter's world, that we embraced that darkness and that knowing that, that it would be redeemed. And Sorry. also, we were just, just to say that we, we were aided and abetted with some wonderful music, mm -hmm. Richard Beasley, and, um, and they were on, I think it was only three, people, three musicians, and they, they did it with us every mm -hmm. night. It, was, it wasn't mm -hmm. like, in fact, it was one of the, probably one of the only or very few productions where um, it's not just left to the actors, apart yes. from obviously stage management and everybody else, but the lighting designer goes, the, the costume designer goes, the director goes, and in the end, you have to do it. Mm -hmm. But, of course, they return and mm. bring it back to life. But to have the musicians there every mm. night, giving us that, that mm -hmm. sense of... Because sometimes you felt a, a heaviness or a weariness mm. or, or a tiredness, mm. and then... The, just a little but they were reacting, just, weren't they, to yes. us? It wasn't the same every night, was it? No, it that wasn't. was extraordinary. If we were a bit down, they, were they, they didn't push. Mm -hmm. no. You know, the music. They would just mm -hmm. play what you were, mm -hmm. what you were expressing, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. brought it up mm -hmm. to a level that mm -hmm. we thought was right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and the, what we call what Ben was talking about the wake, what we called the waking up scene, because we that was our maturity, I suppose, mm -hmm. that we'd obviously 
it's never, it's never talked about, but they are, uh, which is why it isn't a children's play, really, but they obviously fucked, and whatever happened in that, in that forest, they, they lost their virginity, or something happened where they found themselves. And it was, it's never quite spoken that Demetrius doesn't, doesn't love Helena back and is made to love Helena with the dr drops in the eyes. When we wake up, there are no drops. Mm. So why are we still together? Mm. Because something happens. Mm. Mm. Although, you just said, I think it's very few lines, isn't it, that waking up yes, scene? It's a tiny scene, it's four or very five lines. Small, like, we, what happened, is it? Mm. And Peter even encouraged us to sing a, sing a note if we wanted to. Yes. Um, mm. Just. There was always a tendency for people, the thing. lovers, to kind of move into song. I mean, the, 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 mm. a line might be in the way that the great verse can. It seems suddenly to turn so close to a song that you, you started singing. Yes. Lines that had a musicality. Kind of lullaby. I think that was our, our device that was, that was accessible and tender for the audience. When your feelings go beyond words, but you have words, well, you sing them. Mm. Mm that it's a way of conveying to the audience, I, I've got to the stage where I've, I'm right up to the limit of mm -hmm. being able to speak about this, I'm gonna have to do something else. So mm. I, thought, I thought that mm. device was lovely. Mm. You sang, and Mary sang, <laughs> yes. and mm. I sang, and <laughs> Christopher sang too. And in the second version, I sang. You did. I got a, a beard song, if oh, you remember. You? <laughs> uh, what beard shall I do it in? Well, I can do it in your straw colour beard, your purpling grain beard. Yeah. But that was all song. That's a wonderful thing to suddenly burst sing, into yeah. song. They were real actors, yes. you know. They weren't really workmen, they were actors' workmen. That's what's wonderful. <laughs> because he sang. Oh, yes. And the sweet bully bottom. Oh, well, that was a disaster. That <laughs> oh, we never quite got the note. Oh, I, I love That's my favourite part of the play. Oh, Don't dear. spoil it for me. <laughs> None of the Beautiful. mechanicals could sing the note, which it started on. So every night it started on a different note and it went nowhere. <laughs> so. <laughs> Glyn Lewis was given a little tiny tuning thing which you blow and it gave the note, but he put it in the wrong way around. So it was wrong <laughs> way. Every night something went wrong with that song. <laughs> we were always in hysterical, so we had to cry, pretend to cry at the end. It was awful. <laughs> and this, this was the workers waiting for bottom and <laughs> thinking he's never going to come, and, and so he's lost sixpence a, a day. <laughs> day. Very important, that sixpence a day. Yes. And that was a lot of money. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Peter, I, I, we talked about the journey that the lovers go through, but, but the journey that Oberon and Titania go through, mm -hmm. they reach a remarkable point late in the play of thou and I knew in amity. Mm. But it's a very strange route to get there that Oberon has taken. And I wonder about your thinking and, and working, obviously, with, with Alan Howard and Sarah Kesselman to, to find that journey that, that makes Oberon decide that Really, what, what, how am I going to win my wife back? How am I going to change what's gone wrong in the relationship? This, this, is, this is a strange route to take. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. <laughs> well, you've heard very eloquently from everyone about moments in rehearsal. I think that it's important really to evoke what the actual essential movement of the rehearsals was. And that started with something without which we could never have done this, which was the possibility, how many weeks did we rehearse? 10 weeks? 10 mm -hmm. weeks, yes. Mm -hmm. Something unheard of. But it was, came about through absolute necessity. You know, when I was first asked if I would do this play, there was one condition. We have to have, and already we'd, in Stratford, we'd been fighting for more time. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you think in the original Shakespeare Festival, it was f five days in which five plays were put on. Mm -hmm. And then I think it was the Russian director, Komischewski, doing Lear, who actually had five days to himself, mm -hmm. uh, not five plays being put on in five days. And gradually, Gradually, this extended until it became what I think three weeks was the standard thing at Stratford. Mm. Three weeks rehearsal for a new production, mm. four weeks 
And here, it was just quite simple. We couldn't do it without the time. And what the time made possible was that from the, the very start, each day, we would work on the body physically for everyone. Mm. We would read the play, just sitting with concentration, reading it, listening to one another, that actual closeness to the play itself through sharing the sound and the reading. Then there was the actual work on the actual difficult acrobatic techniques and the spinning of the wheel, all those which had to be developed and studied and everyone had to do in, still in 10 weeks, which for us was a lot of time, which in China um, would be something you start at the age of five or six mm. and it takes you 20, 30 years to become a respectable master of these techniques, so that for our group of actors, it was a phenomenal challenge, starting just from zero to master. But it was part of the daily process, mm -hmm. including sharing from us, just discussion about what we're doing. And from that process followed improvisation, taking scenes, with no idea of how they were to be so-called staged, but just mm. very freely improvising it with people who had already been prepared themselves individually as a group in these directions all at the same time, the body, the words, the sound, the relations with one another, the freedom. And it was out of that that gradually, I mean, everything, I don't... You know, it's very unfair to everyone when the director is praised for things that were discovered just like that in rehearsal. I can't remember how the Hermia throwing herself at the door and being caught, how that arose, but it certainly wasn't something of my coming in and saying, well, I know what we've got to do. Yeah. <laughs> no, these things arose. And that, and that is slow process out of which that absolute necessity which goes on to this day that you can't go from that and then playing to an audience. There has to be a bridge where there are people that you're sharing the story with and trying to make interest step by step in it which is starting with the children then starting with people like this work this club in Birmingham and then gradually, gradually, you do it until you have a preview. And then you have the first night. And our first night wasn't too good. That I don't remember. No, I, I, I remember it <laughs> very clearly. <laughs> you know, and Peter Hall taking me by the arm and John Barton and saying, no, 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 it's not <laughs> work. And now starting work again and finding whole new thing. I think the thing that for us was the most important, then I remember it was only after that first preview that we saw what was lacking. Mm. I think it was John Barton saying to me, you know, you're breaking this into something, such a new direction, that somehow this must be clear from the start. And the first scene it's a first scene played differently, but you're not taking us into something that makes us mm. sit up and look. And out of that came the idea mm. of starting with the company at the back of the theatre, mm -hmm. all rushing with enormous beat of energy from energy. the yeah. music, and that great energy of everyone rushing onto the set, clambering mm. up, and, and only with that could suddenly the focus go on to the first scene. And that, and so to answer, this is a long answer to your question, mm -hmm. but it's uh, in that climate, I can't tell you how or when or what, but very naturally, Titania and Oberon, having gone through all the different stages, found their way into the 
climactic moment with Big R. And one of the decisions you had obviously made very early on, because it's there in terms of the casting, but pretty much unprecedented and now so common, was to cast one actor playing both Theseus and Oberon, and Hippolyta becoming Titania, and a famous moment in, at the end where, of, of, of the forest scene when they walk up the stage as Titania and Oberon, and turn and walk back down mm -hmm. as Theseus and Hippolyta, and it wasn't about, we need to go off and change costume, and we need to do something else, and we've got to do this in secret. And as, no, it was just a walk, mm -hmm. and a, a walk up and a walk back. Mm -hmm. But you made that strong decision. And I wonder about the thinking that says, Theseus, Oberon, I mean, it, it seems so natural to us now, Hippolyta, Titania, but you, you uncovered it. Do you remember the, what led you to that decision? I think it's very simple, but in any play, but Shakespeare more often, but particularly with the Summer Night's Dream, for all of us, starting point is that we have to trust something invisible called imagination. And without an audience using something that isn't often called upon, and which is vital, which is that something called imagination, one can't. And in, in this case, it is again back to the art of the storyteller, even a father telling a story to the kids at bedtime. You're getting their attention. It all comes from a playing with that invisible thing called imagination. And that's really what was in play here. That more than ready and the audience love that, I think you find. Love mm. you turning just like that from one person into another mm -hmm. without having to explain it and justify it by going into the wings and putting <laughs> on a new one. Mm -hmm. Just ask someone else and mm -hmm. everyone's with it. I think Peter never pretended for a minute and therefore we didn't that it wasn't a play. Mm. Mm. It wasn't a play. Mm. But it was, uh, it was, uh, it was, it, it required all the truth of life. Mm -hmm. And in Puck's speech at the end, when he said, we have no cards up our sleeves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's no trick here. Mm -hmm. You know, we're spinning plates, it's a stick and a plate. Mm -hmm. And there's a white box and there's costumes and mm -hmm. there's lines. And we hope you enjoyed yourself. Mm -hmm. It sounds so simple, but mm -hmm. you know, how do you make that into a celebration? <laughs> well, I think that that's where the white box naturally came into being. Because in a white box, what came before it was all these years of painted scenery, a forest is a forest, you know, a moon is a moon. And no, oh, audience love being part of the game, a play of imagination. And in a white box, nothing is imposed, so of course. And it's what the workers don't know, because their decision is, we've got to see if the moon is shining that night and we can yeah. open the window. They have that literalness rather than an mm. imagination. That's right, of course, mm. open the window, see if the moon is shining. Yeah. Yeah. Look in the almanac, look in the almanac. <laughs> yes, look in the almanac, see if it's shining. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd like simple. to show our second clip, which is the moment of, of the love drug yeah. being applied to Titania because it's a perspex rod <laughs> uh, and it's a wonderful piece of, of speaking uh, and a voice that many of us remember with such affection. But talk about imagination but it is also one of the most threatening things I've ever seen. Disturbing, troubling. How, how you get to that spot in which that perspex rod becomes something that mm. applies a dangerous drug. <laughs> I know it's imagination. 
but it's, it takes an, a, a different world from anything we'd seen before that makes it possible. Say something about that, Alan. Please. I can still hear his voice. Um, fortunately, I live not too far away from Stratford Avon. And automatically, every time I walk down to a particular corner, I hear, I know a bank where the wild mm. thyme grows. And it will never, never leave my head. He was a mm. tower of strength, a beautiful man, a great company leader, without question, mm -hmm. and an enormous encouragement to the rest of the cast. Um, mm. it was, it's no uh, coincidence that a few years later in his career, he was saying, once more, into the breach, dear friends, once more, because that was in his DNA. Mm wasn't it? He was a general, <laughs> absolute general. Mm. But that, that, that was such a remarkable voice. It's, mm. It is absolutely astonishing. I think he, he held us all together. Mm. Because if we doubted or if we went off the rails, which I'm sure we must mm. have done, in our... But held us together by example. By, not by teaching. No, exactly. not by lecturing. Just by who he was. He exactly. Always say not That's lecturing. Not, was, yes. But just, uh, just... He never never criticised us, never... Mm. But he just... what He was that leader yes. and that, that Oberon, that man, and he just spoke that like that every night for two years. I mean, it's just three, incredible. Three. three. With we went on with, mm. yes. yes, 1973 we finished. Mm. Australia. And it was, uh, you, it was incredible. Can mm. you talk about the tour, taking a show like this right around the world? We have, uh, in, in, a, in a wonderful book of, about the production, we have the kind of packing list of what went into which container and so on to make this show and, and mobile. Skipping countries. You, you had to put your stuff in one a great big basket, but you knew you wouldn't see it until you got to Hungary because it, that went somewhere else, and it was mm -hmm. quite, quite... But what about Alan on that tour was he was the solidness of it mm -hmm. and never, never showed it in any way. A natural leader, it was mm -hmm. great. The tour was extraordinary because you got the chance to play it to other people, Japanese people, to German people, which were the best audiences, as I remarked, in the world, mm -hmm. the Germans. Uh, just phenomenal, because they leant forward and not like the English who sit back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just so simple, mm -hmm. part of their life. Theatre in England, mm -hmm. <laughs> just one of those ridiculous things. Mm -hmm. And I remember on the very opening night in Berlin, Alan Howard said, look, we have to control this audience because they're going mad. And <laughs> I said with uh, mm -hmm. Philip, uh, whatever, I can't remember his name. Philip Le Bloc, who's queen. He said, no, we've got them. They're on our side because we're doing the comedy. And he was quite right. <laughs> so we didn't obey him that time, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> No, it was an extraordinary tour. And it, it was, what was the strength was the play and the production. You know, you, I've taken tours around the world before. They don't exist like that. Because the play was important. And in a way, we weren't. Nobody was important in that play. But the play, so you were all, without knowing it, pouring into that play. And it survived and became brilliant. And the, the filming in Japan was extraordinary. The quality of that, they'd already got high definition, which is a long time ago. The quality of that filming was extraordinary. And the, and the simplicity again of it. But we went everywhere, Australia, America, everywhere. It's great. You should have come, all of you. <laughs> <laughs> Francis was talking earlier about um, the secret, the secret play. But also during rehearsal, if you remember, I'm sure you do, that Peter said, because it was, a, was not an easy room to leave. I wanted to sleep in that rehearsal room. I didn't want to leave it. It was very hard to leave mm. that extraordinary mm. world that we were creating. Mm. Um, and I remember Peter recommending that when we leave the room and meet the other people in the company, mm -hmm. he said, don't talk about what we're doing. Mm. <laughs> so that, that hugely empowered us, because we mm. all had a secret. Mm. Mm. We were on a secret mission. Mm. And I'm sure <laughs> I was only part of the first part of the tour, but I'm sure that secret mm. Mm. was the volition that pushed it around the world you're for right, three years. Right. Absolutely mm. right. We have secrets. Mm. I think it also took on a kind of 
it was unifying, but it was also very individualistic in one sense, which was actually quite helpful, is that I think we might have all felt separately that we had the seat. We had the seat. Sure, sure. Because I remember John Kane, and we called him David Kane because yeah, he was yeah. David then. He said, uh, what, 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 do you th "What do you think the secret is?" And he said, "Do you think it's you?" <laughs> so I said, "I think it could be Helena." Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But then, if you asked every actor that, mm -hmm. they could all say, yeah. oh, no, no, "It's Oprah." Oh, I'm sorry, it's Sonia. <laughs> uh, oh no, it's the that you that you actually you had this incredible unity without necessarily having to be lovers or b best friends. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the faith that, and trust you had in each other mm. uh, because of what we were doing didn't necessitate mm -hmm. that uh, we, were, we were husband and wife in it or, mm. or whatever form of lovers. <laughs> mm. that, w that wasn't, which I thought was very interesting because it showed the power of uh, the trust of, of, of what we were doing, really, trust. that we respected each other. And, and it sounds a bit highfalutin, I didn't mm -hmm. mean it like that. But I mean, we did respect it because of what we had gone through with Peter, mm -hmm. that it was, we, we were on the right course. Mm. And, um, and if we stumbled, you just had to look mm -hmm. to the other actor and they would mm -hmm. step forward Mm. Which, which I thought was very... And I always wondered how you and the other cast who took it on after we, we left. Mm. And I think Jenny Stoller is here tonight and she played Helena after me and mm. went on that mm. tour. <laughs> and I can't imagine what it was like to take it into another world, into another mm. journey. Because in that way that this this thing of thinking that this plays about oneself, in a way. Um, I, I was jealous of that, even though it was our decision not to carry mm. forth, mm. carry on with it for, for various reasons. But um, I remember thinking, no, no, it's, that's, that belongs, belongs to us. Helena. But it belonged to Helena. Helena. <laughs> 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 There's a... There's a thing that Peter said in rehearsal, which I find one of the most fascinating things he's ever said. That, well, no, I like, give me a chance. It's very good. It's very good. It's very important. He said that whenever you get a play within a play, between the two plays is a secret play. And I thought that was an extraordinary piece of insight. And we spent three years looking for that secret play. Yes. You might never find it, but the journey yeah. is the most important mm, thing. Mm, and mm. do you remember that? Do you remember that the, the idea of the, the play within the play? Between the two yeah. plays, there is a secret play. Yeah. 